Hello, and welcome to Elevator Pitch Series for the Radiographer. I am Michael, and this is the fifth video in the series on radiographic equipment. In this video, we'll be looking at electrical safety devices. We'll be looking at the functions and components of a fuse. We'll be learning about switches and how they operate. We'll also be looking at circuit breakers and the types of interlocks. Over the last four videos, we have learned about how electricity is generated and passed into the X-ray unit for use. There are times when this electrical supply could be problematic. In cases of electrical overloads and power surges, electricity could damage the equipment it supplies. There are certain devices in place to reduce the chances of this occurring. These devices are known as electrical safety devices. Common electrical safety devices that you'll find in radiography include fuses, switches, circuit breakers, and interlocks. The first electrical safety device we'll be looking at is the fuse. It is a metal resistor wire which protects electrical equipment from damage due to abnormally high current. How does it do this? A fuse is connected in series to the equipment it protects. All incoming electricity has to pass through the fuse to get to the equipment or load. As you can see on the diagram, the fuse is between the source of electric current and the equipment, labeled as load. Take note that, current moves in a clockwise direction from the source of current, this means that the current cannot get to the load without passing through the fuse first. This is good, because any current that is high enough to damage the equipment would melt the fuse. And if the fuse melts, this circuit that is closed will be opened, and from our knowledge of basic electricity, current cannot flow in an open circuit. Thus, the high current damages the fuse, because the fuse is damaged, electrical supply to the equipment is cut off, and so the high current can no longer travel to the equipment and damage it. Fuses have a certain property known as fuse rating. This is the amount of current that can be conducted through the fuse without it melting. Different fuses have different fuse ratings. This means that, while a certain amount of current will melt some fuses, others can still conduct that amount of current, and it would take much higher current to melt them. The fuse rating to be used depends on the amount of current needed by the equipment that is to be protected. For example, our light bulbs at home need a current of about 5 amperes. This means that they would need a fuse with rating around 5 amperes to protect them. A piece of equipment that needs 30 amperes of electric current, like water heaters, would use a fuse of around 30 amperes. Accidentally using the wrong fuse rating for a piece of equipment should be avoided. The first common one is the error of placing a fuse with a low rating compared to the amount of current needed by the equipment. This would cause the fuse to melt even when normal current is flowing. This is because the equipment of higher rating will draw current that is higher than the limits of the fuse. For example, if a fuse of 5 amperes is used for equipment that needs 15 amperes of current, the equipment would draw the amount of current it needs, which is 15 amperes, from the electrical supply. Now, this 15 amperes of current has to pass through to the 5 ampere fuse first, causing it to melt the fuse, even when it would have not damaged the equipment. While this error will cause the operator to buy a new fuse, it is not as bad as making the mistake of using a fuse with far higher rating than the equipment it protects. If this error is made, the equipment will be destroyed if a surge occurs. Think of it this way, an equipment needs 15 amperes of current and is protected by a 30 ampere fuse. Under normal conditions, 15 amperes of current is supplied to the equipment, and this flows just fine through the 30 ampere fuse. However, if there is an electrical problem and excess current of let's say 25 amperes is coming from the supply, this high current would not melt the 30 ampere fuse, it would make it to the equipment and damage the equipment. Now, let us look at the parts of a fuse. First is the fuse element. This is the wire that does the work of melting during a surge or current overload. It can be made of either tin, lead, aluminium or copper. Next is the fuse link. It is the fuse element plus whatever casing that surrounds the element. Most commonly, you would find a glass cartridge as the casing. However, there are what we know as open fuse links. These types of fuses do not have a casing surrounding them. Do take note that fuses with a casing are better than open fuse links, because open fuse links tend to produce an open spark when they melt. Lastly, the fuse contacts. These are the metal caps present at each end of the glass cartridge. They engage with the fixed contacts on the equipment that they protect. Now that we have covered a lot of information on the fuse and how it works, we should point out that even though the fuse gets destroyed to perform its function of protecting the equipment, it is far less expensive to replace a fuse than to replace a damaged piece of equipment. The next electrical safety device we'll be looking at is the switch. 
It is a device that can either allow current to flow in a circuit or prevent current from flowing in a circuit. Think of it as a bodyguard at the entrance of a party. Sometimes he lets people into the party, but once whoever is in charge says nobody comes in, he stops being so friendly. Common fuses you'll find in radiography are the main supply switch, the on or off X-ray generator switch, the selector switches on the control console, and the exposure switch. Let us look at the main supply switch in a bit more detail. It is usually mounted on the wall near the console. This is important because the main supply switch should be easy to access. There should not be anything placed between the radiographer and the main supply switch. Also, the main supply switch should isolate all equipment in the room from electrical supply. This means that every piece of equipment in a diagnostic radiography room should be under the control of one main supply switch. If you have an X-ray machine and a skull unit in one room, they shouldn't have separate main supply switches, they should both be controlled by one. This is so, because when an emergency happens and all equipment need to be turned off, turning off from the single main supply switch will get this done. If there were multiple switches, it will take more time to turn of all equipment, and remember, in an emergency, every second counts. The main supply switch is usually in a form known as a knife switch. A knife switch is made of a connecting arm and a switch contact also known as a pole. To allow electricity to flow in a circuit, you close the circuit by moving the connecting arm into the pole. On the diagram, the circuit is open, this prevents electricity from flowing. Next is the circuit breaker. This cuts off electrical supply to a piece of equipment when the current in the circuit is too high. It cuts off electrical supply when current is high. This would probably remind us of what the fuse does. Even though the circuit breaker and the fuse are sort of similar in what they do, there are differences. Unlike the fuse, the circuit breaker does not melt or get destroyed to perform its function of protecting the equipment. Also, while fuses melt as soon as dangerous current enters the circuit, circuit breakers do not act immediately. They would allow high current to flow in the circuit for a while, before cutting of the supply. The two common types of circuit breakers are the thermal relay circuit breaker and the magnetic relay circuit breaker. Let us look at the thermal relay circuit breaker. They are made of two metal bars welded together. This is known as a bimetallic strip. On the diagram, you would see the blue metal bar and the red metal bar, both welded together. These two metal bars have different coefficients of expansivity. That is just fancy talk for, one would expand faster than the other when they are heated. On our diagram, the red metal is the more expansive metal. This means that if heat is applied to the bimetallic strip, the red metal will expand faster than the blue. Now, current has a heating effect. As current flows, heat builds up within the circuit. This heat causes the metals to expand. But because of their differences in expansivity, they expand at different rates. This would cause the bimetallic strip to bend towards the less expanding metal, the blue metal bar. This bending of the strip would trigger an off switch which would cut off electric supply to the circuit. You would see on the second diagram that the bimetallic strip is now bent and it causes an off switch that was open to close up. This triggered off switch cuts off electric supply. In order to reset a thermal relay circuit breaker and have current flowing in it again, you have to wait for the bimetallic strip to cool down and return to its original shape. As for the magnetic relay circuit breaker, it is made of an electromagnet, an armature, and a pair of contacts. You'll find all these on the diagram. When current rises above a certain level, the electromagnet becomes energized. And what does an energized magnet do? It attracts metals. The energized electromagnet attracts the metallic armature. Movement of one end of the armature would cause the other end to move. This other end is attached to the contacts of the on switch. As you can see on the second diagram, as the armature moves, the closed contacts open. This opens the circuit and cuts off electric supply. An application of the magnetic circuit breaker is in the on or off switch of the X-ray generator. In this, a magnetic relay circuit breaker is needed to ensure the X-ray unit is not overloaded with current. An advantage of the magnetic relay circuit breaker over the thermal relay is the fact that you do not need to wait for cooling down before it can be reset. We have looked at the fuses, switches and circuit breakers, which all help to protect the equipment in the X-ray unit from electrical damage. Even though these safety devices do a very good job of protecting a lot of electrical equipment, they do not do enough to protect the X-ray tube and trust me, X-ray tubes are not cheap. This is where interlocks come in. They are designed to protect the X-ray tube from damage. They do this by preventing exposures from being made under circumstances that would cause overheating to the anode target. Three common interlocks you'll find connected to the X-ray tube are 
The interlock in the stator which prevents exposures from being made when the anode is not rotating. Remember. In the last video, we talked about how the stator sets up a rotational magnetic field that causes the rotor to rotate. If there is a problem with the stator, the rotor and the node won't rotate. And creating exposures with an anode that is not rotating can destroy it. So. The interlock in the stator senses when there is a fault with the stator and prevents any exposure from being made until the stator is working again. Next is the delay interlock. This introduces a delay period before an exposure is made. That does this to enable the anode to get to its full speed of rotation, about 3600 revolutions per minute, before it makes the exposure. This is because making an exposure with an anode that is not fully rotating is almost as bad as doing so with one that is not rotating at all. Lastly, the overload interlock. This uses analog circuitry to prevent exposures from happening when two high factors, such as the KV or MAS, are selected. That concludes this video on electrical safety devices. We look forward to your questions and comments in the comments section or via email. If you love this video and would want more content, please subscribe and share with your colleagues. Until next time, do enjoy the learning process and take care.